Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collision Repair Magazine's Industry Insider Radio, a podcast for shops, shop owners, techs, and every level of the collision repair industry. I'm your host, James Kerr. Today, we have a diverse panel of folks in to talk about ADAS from multiple perspectives and try and cover everything you and your shop has been missing with advanced driver assistance systems. Today, it's what you don't know about ADAS and its hidden dangers. This episode is brought to you by Level 5 Drive. Level 5 Drive is dedicated to providing documented ADAS calibration services to collision repair, auto glass, daily rental, and mechanical repair providers. For more information on Level 5 Drive, please visit www.level5drive.com. Three guests with us today. John Marlowe is joining us. He's the industry engagement ADAS specialist with Level 5 Drive. But we also have Joe Saputo, owner of CarStar Ancaster, and Joe DeCuna, who's a quality control administrator for Allstate Insurance. Hello, John Marlowe. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited we have such a cross sample of the industry to talk about ADIS, which is a hot topic. Uh, it's on everybody's mind. Some people are are terrified, and that's okay. So we're here to uh, to go through all of the, <clears throat> I think the original title that you had suggested for this was ADAS, the ticking time bomb. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's quite a ticking time bomb, but it's certainly something that we see across the industry as a big deal. And maybe we can dispel some myths today and uh, talk about what's really going on. So, John, you're obviously neck deep in ADAS. Uh, do, do you Absolutely. want to talk a little bit about your 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 love hate relationship with uh, the topic? It's, you know, it's it's mostly a love relationship. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for a little over thirty years now uh, on the collision side of things, and this is just uh, you know one aspect of it that I can get into and help to control the the quality of what's happening, uh, so we can make sure that vehicles are returned to service in a known state. Um, and they're going to be able to uh, function the way that they're they're intended to. Um, as far as uh, ADAS specifically, yeah, just uh, yeah, it's it's apparent that there's uh, some tremendously large gaps in people's knowledge, uh, how they approach, how they look at these things, and hopefully today we can uh, you know discuss with the, the two Joes that are with us and uh, you know help some of the shop owners and and estimators and, and technicians understand what they're looking for and why they need to look for it. Uh, because failing to understand it certainly, you know, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that putting cars back into service in an unknown state is the definition of a ticking time bomb, in my opinion. So today we're setting the record straight on ADAS once and for all, are we? That's the goal. If we can do that, I think we've accomplished something. <laughs> the, yeah, and lofty, lofty afternoon goals. All right. So we also have Joe Saputo, who's the owner of CarStar Ancaster. Hello, Joe. Hello. How are you? I'm I'm very well, thank you. Honestly, everybody's very concerned about me. Thank you. Yeah, uh, all right, Joe. Me. So what brings you here? You're from CarStar Ancaster. You don't represent CarStar. You're here as a uh, as an owner, uh, and we're very thankful to have you here. But do you want to talk a little bit about you and your experience and what brings you here? Absolutely, yes. Uh, very fortunate to have uh, my parents uh, as one of the first car star owners back in the days, which led me to uh, you know to be a little pup in the in the business at a very young age, and uh, you know, twenty five years later, running the businesses and. Uh, uh, I would say just being here in Ancaster, we've always kind of dealt with a little bit of higher end vehicles, which have got us in a little bit of trouble earlier uh, with uh, control data stuff that, you know, cars would come back, you know, a little bit of the higher end stuff saying, hey, this isn't working and that's not working. So I'd say maybe a little bit of a premature um, ATIS style trouble, um, I, mean, I, th I think a little bit prematurely than, than most collision centers that aren't seeing the uh, highly functioning electronic cars. Um, and I think that's why I'm here today to say that I think I started looking at ATIS stuff a little bit. I wouldn't say any earlier than anyone else, but I think I've had a handle on ATIS uh, for quite a while now. And, and uh, we've had a handle on it for the, the past two years now. We've been really heavily involved with ATIS just because we started, I would say, struggling with it um, early on. Well, I think you may be able to say that you were on it a little bit earlier. There's lots of shops that uh, I think believe they can avoid it. 
uh, that it's oh, not going to catch up with them, right? And I, don't uh, like the, I got my hands over my ears. La 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 la. I don't <laughs> <laughs> and we also have uh, also joining us today is the quality control administrator from Allstate Insurance, Joe Takuna. Hello, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, and I hope everybody's all well, and Happy New Year to everybody. Yeah, I I currently work for Allstate, but I just to add clarity, I'm here on my own uh, behalf as uh, you know a concerned uh, citizen as far as the industry is concerned, as a former shop owner, and what I see on my day to day uh, job, uh, it's it's uh, really concerning for me. And why I and I really appreciate the invite here is because we all need to get onto the same page, whether it be communication, what are we doing for our customers, what are we doing for our partners, uh, shop owners, and of course our staff. And setting those guidelines, understanding the system, just to voice what John was saying earlier, it's really, really important that we're all on the same page. And that starts with communication. Equally as important is the dollars and cents and making sure our customers' cars are are drivable uh, in a safe manner, whether it be uh, at minimum, even if it's not related to a, a, a loss, as an example, it's important that at least the customer is informed as to what the status is of his vehicle, whether it be related to a loss or not, is irrelevant in terms of this discussion. But we need to do all the right things for our mutual customers, uh, the industry overall, and that all starts with communication, and of course, equally as important, having the knowledge and 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 the know-how to do deep dives when necessary, or at minimum, um, you know, go out and sublet the service to John, as an example. That's my well, little plug for you, John. Yeah, well, we we all have the same goal, I think, but uh, everyone has got a little bit different of an idea of how we how we reach that and what our priorities should be and, and how to structure uh, our time and, and the dollar spend. And that's a, that's a complicated, it's a bit of a mess. It's a bit of a mess, I think. And uh, let's try and, let's try and solve that whole issue today if we, if we can. So let's start with public perception. There's a disconnect, I think. And even just in this introduction, I think that's been made apparent between what the public perception is of ADAS and what ADAS actually is, even setting aside just like shop to shop conflicts of what of perception of ADAS, where's this disconnect happening? John, could you speak to that a little? Uh, yeah, I think I can, uh, as a matter of fact. So the consumer, uh, as educated as they may be on overall product availability, pricing, of that sort of thing, um, they tend to have very little in the way of education about the features their vehicles have. Um, we, we encounter a lot of people that really don't even understand the full capabilities of the vehicles they bought because the people selling them don't really understand it. But one thing that we have learned is that people will say on one hand that this is all how do they say it? Um, they're unnecessary features. They don't necessarily see the benefit in them. But then on the other hand, our own internal studies that we've done indicate that a customer driving a vehicle with blind spot monitors, who's never had blind spot monitors before, will do a shoulder check 11 times on average before they completely 100% fully trust those blind spot monitors. So basically what I'm saying is they'll jump in a car that they've, they've never driven, has blind spot monitors, the first 11 times they change lanes, they're doing the shoulder check, they're doing the look, the same as they always have. But each time they do it, if there's a car there, the light comes on. If there isn't a car there, the light doesn't come on. They notice this and instinctively begin to trust it to the point that when they get back in their own car that does not have these devices, they've stopped doing a shoulder check. So on one hand, they're saying they don't necessarily see the value in it. On the other hand, they're prepared to intrinsically and, and fully trust these systems that are that are functional and are going to you know perform uh, the, the the task that they're supposed to perform every time. So, so there's a, a the combination, distance. sorry, a combination yeah. of ignoring ADAS functions and then coming to over rely on them and then being confused about which cars have ADAS and which ones don't. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it it, it actually happens this way. Uh, it, I I can't tell you the number of times we get calls from collision shops we've 
properly and fully calibrated and, and, and put the vehicles into the correct state, the customer gets it back, complains to the collision shop that some function is no longer present, only to discover that it was their rental that had that function. Their original car never had it. But in oh, their wow. mind, you know, when I back up, this the, if, there's a, if there's a pedestrian behind me when I'm backing up, my car will stop. But their car won't because it doesn't have that. The rental car they were driving for two weeks or three weeks did have it. That's how quickly they begin to rely on these things. It is, it's all background noise to them. Well, gosh, I guess that's better than uh, somebody ignoring a safety feature to the point of why is it even in the car? Uh, but like I, I know for myself, I over rely on my backup camera at this point. Uh, I'm not as likely to throw my neck out uh, okay. over over the the back seat when I've got the backup camera. So I I yeah that I I see I see that that's happening. Um, time is that it? Is is it just an issue of time of getting people getting the all these things standard? Uh, should there be more of a push in the industry to to standardize ADIS? Well, I mean, yeah, I think uh, standardization. <laughs> Short answer, is yes. Part of it. Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, standardization is part of the solution. Uh, but the the bigger part for from where we sit on the collision side is the understanding that telling someone that their front uh, adaptive cruise control radar is not functioning is not really going to be an effective communication with them because they're going to jump in the car and the chances are they're going to rely on it whether it's functioning or not. Mm. And they're only, only when it you know when they're relying on it and it's not functional then it becomes a problem that you know they're going to encounter all by themselves out in traffic with no support. So this has become a technologically advanced version of my car makes a ticking sound when I turn the wheel, but don't worry, it's fine. Well, it's, it's not even necessarily they're ignoring it. Again, going back to you know the customer who has a vehicle that has some advanced features, drives a rental for a few days that has a different set of advanced features, then goes back to their car fully expecting that it's going to do what the rental car did. Um, just imagine yourself in a, it, well, we'll go back to the blind spots because people rely on those heavier than, than everything else. And, and we're able to measure how they're using them. Um, so you jump in a car that has just been collision repaired. The collision shop tells you, hey, your monitors aren't working. We're waiting for a part. You go out on the road, but your car has this feature and you don't check your lane. You don't do your shoulder check because you, you know that this feature exists and this feature is functional. It's it's just so difficult to get people to backtrack and drive the car as if it doesn't have those features anymore. Mm, interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about timeline and how we got there. Uh, when did collision shops have to start worrying about ADAS? Joseph Puto, I'll ask you, because you said that uh, you were a little bit of an early adopter of these. Uh, just a bit of background of where are we now? What's the state of ADAS? When did this start being an issue? Um, yeah, I mean... For me, as a collision center owner, um, uh, I, I, you know, we 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 basically um, this is two buckets. There's the collision center, uh, and then there's the ADAS. And as much as we'd like to kind of understand it, um, it's it's very challenging for us to try to understand the ADAS functions because we're trying to focus on repairing a car properly, having the right equipment to do so. And that's challenging in itself, let alone trying to understand uh, ADAS functions and, and how it works. But we've been, you know, for, I wouldn't even say a block of better terms, but I would use the word blessed to have something called, you know, ADAS think when we can write a sheet, uh, whether it be preliminary or not, and run what's called an ADAS think that shows us, you know, a, a, an operation as simple as taking off a door handle or a mirror uh, triggers uh, the need to recalibrate lane departure or whatnot um, lets my team in the collision center focus on doing our job diligently in a timely fashion to get those uh, repairs done quick and then sent off to uh, the ADAS calibration center for them to do their job. It separates us so that our bucket gets filled, the ADAS bucket gets filled, and both get done in a very timely fashion. Um, and my guys in the collision center can focus on doing their job very diligently, which is the collision side of things. And then the ADA side, which is a direct conduit to the collision side, don't get me wrong, but inside of my building, we're doing collision hands-on uh, repairs and replacements, and we're leaving the ADAS functions to a capable, reliable 
um, ADAS uh, repairer, or John, I hope I don't offend you with ADAS repairer. I don't, I don't know, but uh, we're leaving that bucket for them to fill and they're doing it incredibly capable because it has a very clear, strong foundation right from the, right from the initial forecast before we've even opened up a door or a bumper on that car. We've got this uh, ADAS think, um, uh, you know, uh, forecast that we're following. So it, it starts before the uh, repair even begins. Uh, if that was the question, um, I hope I've answered it correctly. But if, if you're going back on when we started doing this, I, I would say it's been two years now um, and it would start as early, I would think, and I don't like to think unless I have some facts, but I would say around the 2016, it started hitting us with some of these vehicles where we do a repair on a rear body panel and uh, wouldn't be bang on 100% if it was a sheet metal pole or something. And we start to see some, you know, miscommunication with a, with a blind side or, uh, uh, you know, guy would be backing up into an area and it wouldn't quite catch it because the uh the monitor in the rear wasn't lined up a hundred percent i'd say around the 2016 so i hope I, I answered your question so at this point everyone should have seen this coming into their shops pretty much um i i really hope so i mean what what happened for me and and uh i i'm gonna say this now and i and i don't mean to knock out any dealerships any oems because I, I really this isn't the the, the the key here but i think there was a lot of fog around dealerships uh i i would you know after that happened it happened a few times with us where we we uh, I would never say we got into any trouble, but we had some situations where they went, hey, hold on, this car was in an accident. What the heck happened here? And we go to the dealer and they're like, oh, you know, you have to replace the whole rear end of the car for a lack of better terms or something, right? Because it was in an accident. There's a monitor back there. And we go, okay, just throw it back in a second gear. Just relax for a minute here. And and we 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 start to understand that this bracket that houses a monitor, it it doesn't look damaged, but it certainly needs to be replaced. And, and we can go about that and we learn, but we didn't have any understanding from the OE who didn't have any understanding from, they didn't have the equipment for it. They didn't have any uh, uh, literature for it. And as for us, as a collision center, whether we, and we were certified for um, the one vehicle that we were working on, we didn't know much about it. Uh, so that's kind of an issue there. Uh, so it was kind of foggy, um, but we, we started to, to truck on and then we learn a little bit more about it due to, you know, your level fives and some of these guys who are professionals in the space. Joe, uh, Joe Sputo, I'll ask you a potentially unfair question. You know, you, you own a collision repair shop. Touch time is everything, right? Like your ability to estimate when you can get the car in and when you can get the car out is, is, is paramount. You don't want it sitting there for any length of time. And you found that the best way to deal with ADAS is to outsource. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you think that's the best way, at least in terms of your solution, because shops can be different, right? Different shops can work in different ways. We're, we're living in a, an industry where shops are trying to bring everything into the shop these days, like trying to bring in glass and bring in upholstery and bring in. And you think that the solution for ADAS is we need to, we need to get it out so that some people who are experts in ADS are going to deal with it for us. Um, yes. I just think you need to be choosing the right vendor because I think John said something very, 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 uh, he hit the nail on the head. He said that the people who are selling the customer, the car, they don't know enough about it. And that couldn't be more true because again, I, I'm not going to sit here and beat up any OEMs or dealers or anything like that, but I'm going to tell you this. There is a lot of situations where we, if we chose to send the car to our local dealer, they do not have the training. They do not have the equipment to do those calibrations. And, and you look, it, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying about maybe the one local dealer, we might have a local dealer for a different OEM that has every single piece of equipment and training, but try and get a, an appointment with them. Um, and of course we're talking about, um, 
Mr. DeCuna said something uh, as well. And let's do this economically because somebody's paying for it. And we don't want to see somebody slide a bill across the desk for $497 to recalibrate something that, you know, is, is an hour operation or, or whatnot. But again, if we're going to outsource things, we need to make sure that we have, you know, things that, ha- that, that show operations, what's needed, facts, number one, and some economic pricing. And to your point, turnover, touch time. What are we dealing with here? Are these people picking up the car? Do we have to deliver it? When I have to drive a car somewhere, is somebody going to pay me to do that? Um, all, All these things need to compound into some type of dividend for the insurance company, the customer, the collision center. It has to be safety driven. That's number one. And of course, economically priced. So I love to bring things into my collision center, whether it be an alignment machine or something, but I'm not interested. It's not that I'm not interested, but I'm not going to bring in calibration machines uh, because I know that, you know, there's some Bosch machines. There's some, this machine, every single make and model, like here in Ancaster, we're working on, if you can name a make and model besides Ferrari Lamborghini or something, we're working on them. And I'm not interested in trying to use one brand to recalibrate every single make and model because I know that that's not right. But I can rely on a vendor. And again, I don't, it's not like a plug here, but I can rely on a guy like Level 5 who I know I've been there. It's, they've got all the right equipment for all the right um, OEs and they've got the literature, they have the proof. Um, and it's uh, touch time. Uh, you know, I don't want to slide it across the desk here, but the touch time is fantastic. And again, economically priced, uh, it's a dividend for everybody. Well, it sounds like you've done the math. Oh, absolutely. Because it's not that I wanted to do the math, but I do have to explain. Yeah, it we're, to we're all forced to do the math, right? Like whether we, have, we, whether we want to or not, but it's uh, uh, good relationships yeah. seem, seem to be key here. Yeah. And we've, again, being uh, one of the first car star stores, we've been in business with these guys uh, like Allstate and Aviva and the, and the big boys for for over 30 years. And, and of course, as partners, you want to keep things economically priced. We don't do things just to slide bills across the desk. We do things because it's economical. It makes sense for everybody. And you got to choose the right partners. You can't just say it's going to get done faster. But yeah, here's a bill for a thousand dollars. It's you know, we do our homework here and, and these things make sense. You bring in the right partners and, and, and again, like we're doing the right job here. Well, Joe Saputo, it sounds like that you've got a handle on ADAS, but not all collision repair shops do. I'd love to hear from uh, Joe DeCuna. Joe, why would a shop, do you think, from and you have a unique perspective uh, to bring on this, why made a shop hesitate to do ADAS pro- repair properly? And why wouldn't they keep in mind the potential repercussions? We haven't even gotten into the repercussions. We know this happens. You know, everyone's trying their best. We're not throwing shade around the industry, but uh, not everyone has it down to a science <laughs> the way Joe Saputa does. No, no and that's absolutely 100% true. And, and and I can only speak about my personal experience. I've been involved in this industry since I was a knee height or a grasshopper. Uh, and the reality is, as a, a, a former shop owner myself, you know, there, there's a huge investment. And then, of course, there's a knowledge question. So the investment in the equipment, whether and I'm not suggesting in any way that somebody should go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on getting calibration equipment for everybody. But at minimum, we need to be all knowledgeable and even the data costs or access to this information. So, you know, the hesitation from uh, some shop owners, okay, uh, and I got to add that many of them now, or at least the progressive ones, are, are seeing the light in terms of, hey, you know, I'm stuck with this stuff, whether I want it or not. It's a necessary evil that I got to do on a day-to-day basis. And it's all about setting expectations moving forward, whether you're going to be subletting the service fully or you're going to do partial in-house, there's going to be some investments made. It is, it's, it's necessary. You have no choice, whether, and I'm going to use Joe's uh, comment a second ago, you know, uh, having the, uh, you know, access to all data, that costs, uh, access to a scanner so I can at least do uh, a pre-scan to find out where I was prior to this knowledge or so I can better inform my customers, my staff, and, and my insurance partners, just to name a few examples, and to be able to set the right expectations. So how we're doing business today uh, versus how we were doing it yesterday and how we're going to do it moving forward, 
there's going to have to be an investment, not just in the equipment, but the knowledge needs to be there. I can't go reach out to John and say, you know, do this unless John has some facts behind it. So back to Joe's point, you know, being, uh, you know, a leader and one of the first maybe to, uh, you know, go more, do a deeper dive than some industry players currently, you know, the investment was made. Uh, the curiosity from Joe as a shop owner, as an example, to to look deeper into this because he realized early on, oh, I have no choice. I got to get involved here. I, I, got, I got to not only inform my staff, my estimators, um, you know, and the importance of turning that key on and looking at the dash now speaks volume. What lights are on the dash? You know, were they there before? How much physical damage is on this car? Is it a scratch versus me? I got to do frame replacement as an example. And then, of course, to add to Joe's point, you know, how much am I going to do in-house? And quite honestly, here's my here's my uh, whole hard opinion. I've been talking about all this stuff back to the days when I was running iCar Canada. Uh, that the fact is that not only do these guys need to access the data, but they have no choice moving forward if they plan to stay in business. And if I'm going to be subletting it to uh, to level five or any other service provider, I need to build solid relationships there where I know that that person is knowledgeable and is going to act on behalf of the industry, the, our consumer or mutual customers, and setting the right expectations. And of course, the communication between the shop, the tech, the customer, and the sublet service provider is critical. And mm -hmm. honestly, we're only at the beginning of uh, all of these concerns and investments and the, the comments that I made earlier were only at the beginning. I mean, years ago, I, I would have to worry about the only events stuff I had was my ABS system. And even people would complain, oh, all of a sudden I hit my brakes hard and they pulsate. No, sir, it's not a pulsation. That was your ABS doing its job. Now it's everything from I can't open my door because there's a car <laughs> passing by me. Or my steering wheel is not a steering wheel anymore because it has weight sensors on it to make sure my hands are on it when I activate my lane to keep or lane departure system. And as far as advancements are concerned, we're only like, uh, you know, there's five big adv advancements coming up when the cars are fully self-driving, self-parking, self-everything. And that technology is here now. But if we deliver it to the consumer, man, you know, like back to John's point, I mean, the dealer, the person that sells that car doesn't even know what that car is equipped with in many cases. Yeah. And the customers don't know what options they have in those cars. I, I, I talk to people all the time. Oh, I didn't know it did that. I mean, even the start stop feature, as an example, uh, is, is, is funny when what even even with our, uh, some of our staff's vehicles, I was getting emails going, hey, my car stops when I get to a light. The engine stops. The second you take your foot off the gas and step on the, I um, mean, take your foot off the brake, step on the gas, bang, the engine kicks back in instantaneously. Well, you know, here's another advanced system for purposes of saving fuel and so on that the consumer didn't even know this thing existed. They got all concerned. And never mind, people in the industry would get concerned that my engine's cutting off when I got to a light. Well, hold on. If you read your manual, you would understand that the system, your car's equipped with it and then it, the system functions this way. So this is not, um, uh, moving forward, we're going to have more stuff to deal with, whether it be lane keep, lane uh, uh, um, lane keep, lane assist, uh, the ABS, uh, adaptive brake lighting systems, and the list goes on and on. That steering column, that steering wheel, like I made I made comment earlier, it's just not a steering wheel. My seat's not a seat. It's got sensors all over to make sure I got a passenger in the car thus to, you know, activate the airbag in case of a collision. So back to uh, using the sublet. I don't know if Joe is able at his facility to go ahead and calibrate that occupant classification system for the passenger seat, but I know my sublet servers can. So, you know, John's uh, John's made a huge investment into this uh, industry as far as being a specialist in the ADI system, but John needs to continue to make large investments moving forward because, like I said a second ago, this is just the beginning. There's so many more advancements happening that I'm going to be frank with you. I was just having this conversation yesterday with my wife and my daughter that by the time my grandkids are able to, and they're young, uh, when they start driving, they don't need a car. They can just call Uber 
or have the car drive itself to to uh, the driveway where they can go to wherever they need to get to. Well, 20 years from now, the car will wake you up out of bed and give you some coffee and uh, and then scoop you up and uh, take you to work. Right. Uh, Absolutely. So it's, it sounds like Joe Kuna, it sounds like the issue here is speed, that the industry is just going at such an incredible pace in terms of development. It's must be so difficult for a shop owner to be able to be not just doing the math, but constantly redoing the math. How much do I need to learn? How much do I need to invest? How much can I uh, outsource? Who can I trust? That's just a full-time job keeping on top of that. Seems like a big deal. So John, I'll ask you, it seems like this ADAS and trying to deal with this ADAS properly is so critical. Why, why do shops not agree? Is it just an issue of like, I, I don't have the time to learn all this new stuff? Like I'm too busy running the shop? I think that's a, a large part of it. Um, you know, so much of the claims administration has been offloaded onto the collision shops over the years. Um, and they're under such pressure to you know maintain their, their cycle times um, that, yeah, learning something new is, is very difficult to add to the mix. Uh, you know, even for, for progressive shops, they, they really struggle to, to stay current with everything. Um, there's also, you know, another element that, uh, you know, is simply doesn't want to acknowledge technology. Doesn't, you know, they've been doing it this way for 30 years and they see no reason to change now. But uh, I'll give you an example of something that actually happened to me um, that uh, I think any shops listening um, would be well advised to consider how this actually plays out for them. So we get a phone call from a collision shop who had repaired a Honda Civic uh, front end. And there were no DTCs, there were no lights on the dash. They test drove the vehicle, found everything was okay, gave it back to the customer. Customer returned a couple of weeks later saying that it wasn't working properly. Uh, sorry, sorry, that their adaptive cruise control was not functioning properly. Uh, they sent it to the dealer who checked it, gave it back to the collision shop, who gave it back to the customer. Everything checked out perfectly. There were no errors. Customer came back again. This time we got the phone call. I picked the vehicle up. As I was driving it back to our lab, there is an exit on the highway I was on, on the left-hand side, which is a little bit unusual for a highway system. As I approached that exit, the car suddenly braked fully in traffic in an attempt to avoid a collision. There was nothing in front of me, but there were cars behind me. What it was detecting was something on the, the left side on-ramp, or uh, off-ramp rather. Um, got the car back to our lab. This particular uh, sensor has a tolerance of one tenth of one degree, but it was off by two full degrees. Well, that so could have traffic, been it for John Marlowe, right? <laughs> it, it absolutely could have been. So imagine a consumer now driving their vehicle and having it. I, I never did get a, a full discussion uh, of what the customer's specific complaint was other than it's not working properly. But this is what happens day in and day out. The car show, shows no signs outwardly. The shop may even do a quick test drive and find everything is working fine. But what the shop can't do is test that system under every possible operating condition that it was designed for. In order to ensure that the system is going to function the way it's supposed to, a calibration must be performed. And the only way to know that you need to do a calibration is to research. So that means look at the service manual. It means check the operations you're performing and you have to follow all the way down the rabbit hole to see if it yields you know, some calibration that, that's required. Joe pointed out a, a piece of software called uh, ADAS Think, which is available through a company called Repairify. Uh, our customers do not have to pay for that product. If they send us their estimates, we will scrub them through, um, through ADAS Think for them and provide them with uh, an estimate of the cost uh, for any operations that need to be performed. Uh, it's not a replacement for research. It's an enhancement to your research. But uh, research is absolutely critical to understanding when and how these systems need to be addressed. Joe Saputo, it seems to me everything, like every OEM, insurance, uh, ADAS, the technology itself, everything wants you to do the most amount of research and forethought and to pay it the most attention. How on earth, as a shop owner, do you take all this demand and uh, 
put a safe vehicle back on the road? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, that's kind of why I was mentioning earlier in the conversation about these buckets, right? Like as a collision center, I have a hard enough time keeping up with the technology of staying certified for all the brands that I'm working on and keeping up with the investment into the tooling for that and the data that I have to purchase for them, um, let alone researching calibrations uh, or, or the equipment for that. Like I would love to make an investment into some calibration equipment, but with how it's changing so quickly. I already know if I spent 50, 100 or $200,000 on calibration equipment, I could already write a check and date it 2024 for another $200,000 because that's how fast it's changing. And that's how much, and I'm not ever doing that because I need to split up this bucket to go, let me, let me please just concentrate inside of this block building on collision uh directly related to the body and structure of the vehicle and leave these things to mr marlowe and the the professionals um now to, to case in point i mean i think when john was speaking of uh the uh the situation there with that car though i mean these types of things are our worst nightmares and and they do absolutely happen all the t- well sorry and i don't want to sound they certainly don't happen to me because it it has happened a few times where you know a car will come back and they'll go uh you know something's not right here and that's where we put the end of that and we started doing doing uh t- doing ADAS. but again when it comes to um the worst thing can be is when you don't see any lights on the dash and we do have the investment into scan tools and we see uh, we do pre, pre-scan, post-scan, but th- I, I don't care if there's nothing on the dash uh, because that's where it's hidden, right? Like you don't get to see, um, you know, these these hidden codes and to make the investment into uh, learning more about it. I just, I, I don't have the time or the, the, uh, the resources to invest into it. So, um, and I do apologize. I don't really know if I, I, I got your question. Uh, well, it's just I, the the picture that's being painted is that like every collision and pair shop is like Gumby being pulled in five different directions at once. Pair, I'm sure that's how uh, shops are feeling is that they're tearing their hair out of saying, I can't keep on top of all this new development. Yeah. And that's, and sorry. So I guess that's, yeah, that's kind of what I was speaking to there. So, but when it comes to this stuff, I mean, the entire world is, is moving towards AI stuff like this. And, and, and in our space, I, I think we know well enough that again, that, and, and the insurers, the insurance companies and everybody else does understand how challenging uh, it is for the collision centers to keep up with the advancements in technology and certifications and whatnot that, uh, uh, having lightweight, for lack of better terms, sir, uh, uh, ADAS uh, equipment is is fine. But again, I don't think anybody expects the collision center to continuously update uh, their equipment to handle it in house, unless you're some, you know, fifty thousand square foot building or something like that. Maybe possibly the elite guys, but um, yeah, it, it certainly is moving very, very fast. And I also do hear, and I mean, I'm sure John can speak more of this, maybe even Joe, but you do hear about these self calibrating cars and it's just another thing where I throw my head up in the air and go, Oh my God, okay, here we go. Now we're going to have self inflating tires too. And like, you know, um, self calibrating cars are another thing that we hear about, but to be completely honest with you, I just, you know, I always envisioned, and, and my dad made this comment a couple of years ago, where he thought that he'd be coming in here very shortly and seeing kids walking around in lab coats fixing cars with computers, and nobody laughed about it. We all went, yeah, it's true, because half of these cars are electronic. Like, I just remember, you know, being young and seeing cars coming in here crunched up and people not coming to clean their cars out because they were in the hospital for weeks and months. And now I see cars coming in here that look, really really bad and the car the people are here in great shape because the engineering that goes into these cars is incredible like absolutely incredible and a lot of that has to do with the ADS components or the safety components that are electronically installed into these cars and as a collision center I say a lot of the times we're just unbolting panels throwing them in the garbage and putting brand new ones on whereas before we used to repair half of them but unfortunately somebody sustained a pretty bad 
you know, injury. Um, so it's changing so fast. And I think it's better for the consumer safety wise, but let's not forget that half of that is electronic and there's nobody in my building that has hands like sandpaper that's going to recalibrate or, or fix the electronic components of that. So there's this, there's this conduit in marriage between an ADAS technician and a collision technician that kind of has to conceptually uh, uh, marry to, to get this car back on the road safely. And, and again, economically, and, and, and it's got to be done. I think as a severity standpoint, the insurance companies 100% understand and agree that, that the, the repairs aren't going down. They're, they're going up and, and that's understandable. There's no doubt about that. But, I, I, you know, there's a lot of times like I don't think when it comes to ADAS, you're not replacing too much. You're, you're repairing a lot. So all it really takes is re repairing or replacing some body components repairing or recalibrating some electrical components. And if we could kind of forecast that collaboratively, um, again, between a, a, an ADAS technician and a collision technician, um, there could be a pretty darn good economical, uh, again, getting on touch, touch time. We can do that pretty successfully at an, at an economical uh, price point and, uh, uh, safely and again, I think I'll stick to that word. It's it pays quite a good dividend for the customer, the the the, the shop, and uh, the insurance company. Well, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> well, again, if you do it right, you have a good pathway of insurance partners and good vendors. Uh, sorry to say, it it, it does kind of go smoothly. I like to ask Joe Dakuna. Joe Dakuna, what? What do you see as the dangers of not taking ADAS seriously? Oh, huge. Uh, yeah, and, and it's not just about, you know, uh, safety as it relates to uh, the consumer, whether that, that occupant classification system is functioning properly or a light on a dash or, uh, but, you know, even from a customer service perspective, it's huge. I mean, the pie is the pie in terms of how much business we got out there. Most shops are busy. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, back to Joe's comment, I mean, we all have to uh, uh, deal with this stuff, whether you want to or not, but not 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 uh, being proactive is uh, or pretending that this thing doesn't exist or these issues don't exist. Even if I don't have a light on the dash, it doesn't mean that there's not issues with the ADAS system. It, it just means. Uh, back to John's comment, it just means that, you know, something didn't activate uh, that self-breaking feature because of things off two degrees. I mean, it was functioning properly every once in a while, the light would come back on. That's the customer has to bring it three times. Now, with that customer's example, is that customer going to go back to that facility and on the road? No. In terms of, you know, liability issues, it's, it's huge if somebody actually gets hurt because something failed and we ignored it. So... The challenge is, from a, a shop owner perspective, is uh, you, you know uh, let, let's gain and let's let, let's see what's here because if, like I never worry about the things that I can see, it's all the things that we can't see that become a real problem. So even if I don't have a light on the dash currently, that doesn't mean that I don't have faults. And then in this industry, just because I have no faults on my pre-scan, doesn't mean that I'm not going to have any because I've disconnected all of this stuff during my normal operation of doing the repairs on the collision side. Example, I'm replacing the rear panel. I got to move those computers out of my way so I don't burn any or, or damage any during the repair. Uh, same thing with the wiring harness, okay? You know, John and I were just having a conversation just last week, I believe, about, you know, what's the problem with this thing? It was all working fine before. All my technician did was just plug in this uh, thing. And, and you look at the harness and it looks perfect. But now you go do, do a little big, this is just a quick example. You go pull the connections off and as they were pushing in the connector to join the two harnesses together, the main harness to the rear harness, as an example, they push that small little gold-plated pin back a little bit where it's not making a full connection or making temporary connections. So the car leaves through vibration, through moisture, through uh, potential corrosion down the road, even two, three months down the road, all of a sudden a little water goes in there and then there's now there's a fault. So who's going to take responsibility for that? So <laughs> the, the other part to answer your question, I guess, in the, uh, from a different perspective, it, it, it's going to cost us, not just from the customer service, 
But what about time to re-diagnose something again and potentially again, as opposed to being knowledgeable enough, uh, whether it be you're doing it all in-house or you've got to rely on a sublet service to make sure that things right. And even then, there's always going to be that potential that something may, may happen. In many cases, because we're tampering with the, not tampering, wrong word, uh, but during my normal process of the repair, back to my harness example, hey, maybe the thing was already corroded beforehand. Now, all of a sudden, the corrosion finally broke that wire or caused a, a bad connection issue. So here's a perfect example. It's all working fine before, sir. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't like this before the collision. And I hear that a lot. Okay, so, you know, when I do a deep dive as to what the real cause or where the issue is, hey, we're all human, we make mistakes. And most of the people that I do business with, I would say 99% of them, you know, they step up to the plate and say, yeah, okay, Joe, you know, this is my error, we're going to make it right for everybody. Great. Right. And, you know, that's the right thing to do. And most people that we do business with feel the same way, whether it be John or Joe, uh, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of addressing their customers or mutual customers concerns. But the reality is that we're human, whether you want to do business this way or not, in terms of having to deal with this stuff, you know, Joe and his and made some examples about his dad. I mean, I, I remember the only thing I had to worry about is how do I get this cardio alignment shop? Even if I had the radiator up, I just use a coat hanger, drive it down the alignment shop. It was simple. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong, just big bolted fenders. We've become parts replacement people. And whether you want to deal with that suspension item, no matter how advanced it is, or, you know, ride control, advanced headlamping systems, everything's so integrated today that we have no choice but to deal with the 8S systems. Because just to do that suspension system, as an example, I got to disconnect a number of critical items as it applies to 8S. I'm doing a rear panel. I'm doing a quarter panel. I'm doing a simple bumper job which we would do in a few hours before and, and be profitable at it. Now, all of a sudden, I got to worry about another operation, which leads back to a point I brought earlier. Whether we want to deal with this stuff or not, we have no choice moving forward. From Joe's perspective, how much investment is he going to make in terms of access to knowledge, access to a third-party vendor, for example, as uh, I'll use an example, level five, how much data do I need? And equally as important, or just as important, as my estimator needs to be aware. So from a human resources perspective, it is critical that that technician knows to handle that wiring harness with care, that module with care. Because that little one pin not plugged into the right port on the, on the female side, as an example, oops, a whole problem that we have to spend unnecessary time possibly uh, hinder our relationship with our mutual customers and never mind, you know, the extra time that a guy like John needs to do to further diagnose or do a deeper dive than maybe was uh, originally necessary with, if we took a little more care. So as, as a, from a big picture perspective, we all need to have all these little pieces in line and then be able to sit back on your, and how you do your day-to-day -day business because the way we're doing it today, like I said at the very beginning, the way we do business today is not how we're going to do business tomorrow. Well, if you're still running your shop the way you did 30 years ago, you, you know, you're in trouble at this point. Uh, big time. And, and if big you're time. still running your shop yesterday, the same way tomorrow, you're going to be in trouble at this point. Yeah. It's, oh, it's a big, it's a big topic. Okay. John Marlowe, I'll give you the last word here on the Industry Insider Podcast. If you, uh, you get to play uh, Imagination Time. If you could debunk one myth about ADAS and set the record straight across the entire industry, what would you pick? I would pick the myth that if there is no light and no DTC, you don't have to do a calibration. Good one. Those are not diagnostic. Those are not indicators. Only the service manual will tell you whether you need to do a calibration or not. And I know we're running low on time, but uh, I just want to bring up uh, Stellantis, uh, which is uh, basically Chrysler Corporation, uh, they're being sued in Arizona for not including a front automatic emergency braking radar on a Jeep product on the base model, even though it was included on higher models, 
um, and someone was killed as a result of this vehicle not being equipped, the high court in Arizona has ruled that the, this lawsuit can continue even though that vehicle met minimum safety standards in that state at that time. What this means for shop owners is, what do you think will happen to you when you send a vehicle out that is equipped with this equipment that is not in the correct state when you return it to service? If Chrysler can get sued for not putting it on the car in the first place, what will happen when you return it to service in the incorrect state? Well, food for thought, certainly. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today for Collision Repair Magazine's Industry Insider Radio. Thank you to John Marlowe, who's joining us from Level 5 Drive, uh, the industry engagement and ADAS specialist. So good to have a specialist to talk about our topic uh, today. Thank you very much to Joe Saputo, owner of Carstar Ancaster. Uh, it was really good to get a shop perspective. And thank you very much to Joe DeCuna from the Quality Control Administrator for Allstate Insurance. Uh, what a great discussion today, guys. Uh, I hope now that we've solved ADAS across the industry and that uh, we've put this matter to bed uh, and uh, that the industry will now be wiser uh, when it comes to ADAS. Honestly, I, I like I feel con two conflicting emotions here. I feel like, oh, it's it's a lot simpler than I thought. And oh, there's a whole more complicated world than you could ever imagine. And both of those things, I think, are true of ADAS. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm James Kerr. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or YouTube. And tune in next time for another episode of Industry Insider Radio. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by Level 5 Drive. Level 5 Drive is dedicated to providing documented ADAS calibration services to collision repair, auto glass, daily rental, and mechanical repair providers. For more information on Level 5 Drive, please visit www.level5drive.com.